Chapter Seven, Part One of the History of Standard Oil, Volume One by Ida Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Crisis of eighteen seventy eight. It was clear enough by the opening of eighteen seventy eight that Mr. Rockefeller need no longer fear any serious trouble from the refining element. To be sure, there were scattered concerns still holding out, and some of them doing very well but his latest move had put him in a position to cut off or at least seriously to interfere with the very raw material in which they worked it was hardly to be expected after the defeat of the pennsylvania that any railroad would be rash enough to combine with even a strong group of refiners as for independent pipelines there were so many ways of discouraging their building that it did not seem probable that any one would ever go far it was only a matter of time then when all remaining outside refiners must come into his fold or die mr rockefeller's path would now have been smooth had it not been for the oil producers but the oil producers naturally his enemy he being the buyer and they the seller had become in the six years before mr rockefeller had made himself the only gatherer of their oil irreconcilable opponents of whatever he might do the South Improvement Company they regarded rightly enough as devised to control the price of their product, and that scheme they wrongfully laid entirely at Mr. Rockefeller's door. Mr. Rockefeller had been only one of the originators of the South Improvement Company, but the fact that he had become later practically its only supporter, that he was the only one who had profited by it, and that he had turned his Cleveland plant into a machine for carrying out its provisions, had caused the oil country to fix on him the entire responsibility. Then the oil men's experience with Mr. Rockefeller in 1873 had been unfortunate. They charged the failure of their alliance to his duplicity. There is no doubt that Mr. Rockefeller played a shrewd and false game with the oil men in 1873, but the failure of their alliance was their own fault. They did not hold together they failed to limit their production as they agreed they suspected one another and at a moment when if they had been as patient and wise as their great opponent they would have had the game in their own hands and him at their feet as he had been in eighteen seventy two for the sake of immediate returns they abandoned some of the best features of their organizations and allied themselves with a man they distrusted when that alliance failed they threw on Mr. Rockefeller's shoulder a blame which they should have taken on their own. Another very real cause for their anxiety and dislike was that as the refiners' alliance progressed, the refiners made a much larger share of the profits than the producers thought fair. The abandoning of their alliance in 1873 had, of course, put an end to their measures for limiting production and for holding over production until it could be sold at the prices they thought profitable. The drill had gone on merrily through 1873, 1874, and 1875, regardless of consumption or prices. By the end of 1874 there were over three and a half million barrels of oil in stock, more than twice what there had ever been before. Production was well to a million barrels a month, and prices that year averaged but one dollar and fifteen cents a barrel. For men who considered three dollars a starvation price, this was indeed hard luck. Things looked better by the end of 1875, for production was falling off. By March 1876, stocks had been so reduced that there was strong confidence that the price of crude oil must advance. By June, the oil city Derrick began to prophesy three-dollar oil and to advise oil men to hold crude for that price. In August, three dollars was reached in the oil city exchange. It had been nearly four years since that price had been paid for oil, and the day the point was reached, August 25, the brokers fairly went mad. They jumped on their chairs, threw up their hats, beat one another on the back, while the spectators in the crowded galleries, most of them speculators, yelled in sympathy. Before six o'clock that day, oil reached three dollars eleven and a quarter cents. Nobody thought of stopping because it was supper time. The exchange was open until nearly midnight, prices booming on to three dollars seventeen and a half cents. It seemed like old times in the oil region, the good old flush times when people made a fortune one day 
and threw it away the next. Of course, refined oil went up steadily with crude. Refined reached twenty-one and three-eight cents in New York the day of this boom at Oil City. The day following the rise was one of the most exciting the oil exchange had ever seen. Never before, declared the Derrick in its report, was so much business done. From early in the morning until ten o'clock at night the exchange was crowded by frantic speculators. Their awful excitement was clear from their blanched faces and wild voices. Fully eight hundred thousand barrels of oil exchanged hands that day. The advance between the time the exchange opened and its close was over fifty-five cents. Refined in New York advanced in accordance with the market on the creek, closing at twenty-four cents. This went on for several days when a new element in the situation began to force itself on the oil men's attention. One of the chief reasons on which they based their confidence in high prices for crude oil was the fact that the foreigners were short of refined oil. It was the custom then, as now, for exporters to buy their oil for the winter European trade in the late summer and early fall. When the boom began the harbor at New York was beginning to fill up with ships for cargoes. But to the consternation of the oil men intent on keeping up the boom, the exporters were refusing to buy. They were declaring the price to which refined had risen to be out of proportion to the price of crude. More, they declared the latter a speculative price. Only once, they argued, had it touched four dollars, and the refiners were not buying at that price for manufacture. They were holding refined too high. It was early in September when the realization came upon the oil regions that a new element was in the problem, a veritable blockade in exports. As the days went on they saw that this was no temporary affair. They saw that Mr. Rockefeller's combination was at last carrying out just what it had been organized to do, forcing the price it wanted for refined. Day after day refined was held at twenty-six cents. Day after day the exporters refused to buy. It was not until the end of September, in fact, that they began to yield, as it was inevitable they should do, for the game was certainly in the hands of the refiners, and Europe had to have its light. The exporters began to see, too, that if they held off longer they might have to pay higher prices, for it was rumored that the Standard Combination was shutting down its factories, literally making refined scarce, while crude oil was piling up in Pennsylvania. With the yielding of the exporter exactly what they feared occurred. The price was raised. The exporters balked again. The matter began to attract public attention. The New York Herald was particularly active in airing the situation and did not hesitate to denounce it as a petroleum plot. The leaders were interviewed, among them Mr. Rockefeller. Mr. Rockefeller still held to his theory that to make oil dear was worthy of public approval. They had aimed to control the price of oil in a perfectly legitimate way, he told the Herald reporter, and the exporters would have to yield to their prices. By the end of October, New York Harbor was full of vessels, a mute protest against the corner, and it was not until November that the exporters finally gave in and began to take all the oil they could get at prices asked, which ranged from twenty-six to thirty-five cents. And these prices were held all through the winter of 1876-77 up to February 22. They were held regardless of the price of crude, for, due to their utmost, the producers could not keep their oil up to the corresponding price of refined. According to the scale of relative prices then accepted, twenty-six cents a gallon for refined meant five dollars a barrel for crude, yet there was not a month in the entire period of this hold-up that crude averaged that price. In December, when the average price of refined was twenty-nine and three-eight cents, crude was but three dollars seventy-eight and an eighth cents a barrel. The producers held meetings and passed resolutions, cursed the refiners, and talked of building independent refineries, filled the columns of the derrick with open letters advocating a shutdown, an alliance of their own restrictive legislation, an oil men's railway, and what was more to the point some of them supported, with more or less fidelity, the efforts to build up counter-movements noted in the last chapter, the Columbia Conduit Line, the Seaboard Pipeline, and especially the alliance with the Empire Transportation Company attempted in the spring of 1877. There seemed more hope 
in this last combination than in any other movement, for they had faith in Colonel Potts, and besides they were accustomed to seeing the Pennsylvania Railroad get what it wanted. The defeat of the Pennsylvania was therefore the heavier blow. Indeed, the news of the sale of the Empire pipelines to the Standard was like the sounding of the toxin in the angry and baffled oil regions. It revived the spirit of 1872. But it was the spirit of 1872, with new dignity and a discretion such had never before been seen in the blatant region. In every town from McKean County southwest to Butler, the oil towns hastened to organize themselves into a secret society. Little by little it came out that a producer's union had been organized. From all that could be learned, it looked very much as if the petroleum producers' union had come into existence to do business. On November 21, 1877, the first meeting of the new organization was held, the Petroleum Parliament or Congress it was called. This Congress, which met in Titusville, was composed of 172 delegates. It was claimed that it represented at least 2,000 oil producers and not less than 75 millions in money. It is certain it included the representative men of the oil regions, those to whose daring hard work and energy the discovery and development of the oil fields, as they were known at that time, were entirely due. For four days the Congress was in session, and it is a remarkable comment on the seriousness with which it had undertaken its work that although reporters from all parts of the country interested in oil were present, nothing leaked out. In December a second session of four days was held in Titusville, but no announcement of what was doing was made to the press. Indeed, it was only as lines of action developed that the public became familiar with what the producers had resolved on in the days of secret session which they had held. Their resolutions had been eminently wise, and they undertook their support vigorously and intelligently. First and foremost, they resolved to stand by all efforts to secure an outlet to the independent seaboard of the Standard and the Allied Railroads. Two enterprises were put before them at once. The first was what was known as the Equitable Petroleum Company, an organization started by one of the most resourceful and active independent men in the oil country, one of whom we are to hear more, Lewis Emery, Jr., this company, in which some 200 oil producers in the Bradford field had taken stock, proposed to lay a pipeline to Buffalo and to ship their oil thence by the Erie Canal. They had acquired a right-of-way to Buffalo and had capital pledged to carry out the project. The second enterprise to come before the newly formed union was much more ambitious. It was nothing less than a revival of Mr. Harley's enterprise, which had attracted so much attention in 1876. It was revived now by the three men who had been operating the Columbia Conduit Line under a lease, Messrs. Benson, McKelvey, and Hopkins, who had been set free by the sale of that property to the Standard. Their experience with the pipeline business had convinced them it was one of the most lucrative departments of the oil industry. They believed, too, that oil could be pumped over the mountains, and no sooner were they free than they took up Mr. Harley's old idea and engaged the same engineer he had brought into the enterprise, General Herman Haupt, to survey a route from Brady's Bend on the Allegheny River to Baltimore, Maryland, a distance of 235 miles. To both of these projects the General Council of the Union gave promise of support. The demand for interstate commerce legislation was renewed at once by the Union, and in December E. G. Patterson, the head of the committee having the matter in hand, prepared the first draft of an act which was put in formal shape by George B. Hibbert of Buffalo, counsel employed by the Union for this purpose. Mr. Hibbert also prepared a memorandum of the law on the subject. The bill prepared by Mr. Patterson and Mr. Hibbert was introduced into the House of Representatives in May 1878 by Lewis F. Watson, whose home was in Warren County, Pennsylvania. It was called into committee and came out as the Reagan bill, and as such was passed by the end of the year by the House, but only to be smothered later in the Senate. At the same time that the effort was going on in Washington for relief, the legislature of Pennsylvania was being besieged again for a free pipeline bill and an anti-discrimination bill. Both of these projects failed, 
and the committee having them in charge said bitterly in its report to the Union, How well we have succeeded at Harrisburg you all know. It would be in vain for your committee to describe the efforts of the Council in this direction. It has been simply a history of failure and disgrace. If it has taught us anything, it is that our present lawmakers, as a body, are ignorant, corrupt, and unprincipled, that the majority of them are, directly or indirectly, under the control of the very monopolies against whose acts we have been seeking relief, there has been invented by the Standard Oil Company no argument or assertion, however false or ridiculous, which has not found a man in the Pennsylvania legislature mean enough to become its champion. On every side, indeed, the producers hastened to protect themselves against the lord of the oil regions, as Mr. Rockefeller, not inaptly, was called on the completion of his pipeline monopoly. That they were not merely alarmist in thinking that they must do something to protect their interests was demonstrated sooner than was anticipated. The demonstration was hurried by an unforeseen and difficult situation, a great outpouring of oil in a new field the Bradford or Northern Field in McKean County, Pennsylvania. About the time that Mr. Rockefeller's lordship was realized, it became certain that a deposit of oil had been discovered which was going to lead soon to a production vastly in excess of the consumption as well as in excess of the then existing facilities for gathering and storing oil. If Mr. Rockefeller wished to keep his monopoly, he must, it was evident, enter upon a campaign of expansion calling for an immense expenditure of energy and money. He must lay pipes in a hundred directions to get the output of new wells. He must build tanks holding thousands of barrels to receive the oil. And all of this must be done quickly if rivals were to be kept out of the way. There was no hesitation on the part of the United Pipelines. One of the greatest construction feats the country has ever seen was put through in the years 1878, 1879, and 1880 in the Bradford oil field by the Standard Interest. It was a wonderful illustration of the surpassing intelligence, energy, and courage with which the Standard Oil attacks its problems. But while it was putting through this feat, it instituted a policy toward the producers which was regarded by them as tyrannical and unjustifiable. The first maneuver in this new policy hit the producer in a very tender spot, for it concerned the price he was to receive for oil. The method which prevailed at the time in handling and buying and selling oil was this. At the request of a well owner connected with his pipeline, his oil was run and credited to him in the pipeline office. Here he could hold it as long as he wished by paying a storage charge. If he wished to sell his credit balance, as oil to his account was called, he simply gave the buyer an order on the line for the oil, and it was transferred to the account of the new buyer. The pipelines frequently had hundreds of thousands of barrels of oil in hand, and they traded with this oil as banks do with their deposits. That is, they issued certificates for each 1,000 barrels of oil on hand, and these certificates were negotiable like any other paper. Now, the United Pipelines acknowledged itself a common carrier and so was obliged to discharge the duty of collecting oil on demand, or at least within a reasonable time after the demand of its patrons. But in December 1877, after the monopoly was completed, they refused to discharge their obligations in the customary way. On the plea that they had not sufficient tankage to carry oil in the Bradford field, they issued an order that no oil would be run in that district for anyone unless it was sold for immediate shipment. That is, no oil would be taken to hold for storage, it would be taken for shipping only. At the same time, the standard buyer, J. A. Bostwick, decreed that henceforth no Bradford oil would be bought for immediate shipment unless it was offered at less than the market price. No fixed discount was set. The seller was asked what he would take. His offer was, of course, according to his necessities. Even then, an answer was not always immediately given. The seller was told to come back in five or ten days, and he would be told if his oil would be taken. A feature of the new order, particularly galling to the oil men, was the manner in which it was enforced. Formerly, the buyer and seller had met freely in the oil exchanges and their business offices, and transactions had been carried on as among equals.
now the producers were obliged to form in line before the united pipeline offices and to enter one at a time to consult the buyer a line of a hundred men or more often stood during the hours set before the office waiting their turn to dispose of their oil it should be said in justice to mr bostwick that he was not the first buyer to take oil at a discount the producers themselves frequently offered oil at less than the market price when in need of money but mr bostwick was the first buyer in a situation to force them to make the discount regularly when these orders came few of the producers had sufficient private tankage to take care of any amount of oil here was the situation then to keep oil from running on the ground the producer must sell it but if he sold it he must take a price from two to twenty-five cents or more below the market the immediate shipment order was not an invention of the united pipelines it had been enforced more than once for brief periods by various lines when they found their capacity overcrowded by some unexpected situation in eighteen seventy two episodic among the horses so upset things in the oil regions that for a short time an immediate shipment order was enforced in eighteen seventy two when the pipelines were overtaxed by a great outpouring of oil in the lower field immediate shipment had been attempted but at that time there were still so many independent pipes struggling for business that the movement met no success now however the united pipeline had things its own way that they were not ready to meet the growing bradford production is plain from a study of the figures there were in the oil regions at the close of eighteen seventy seven according to the oil city derrick four million barrels of tankage there was on hand at this time three million one hundred and twenty seven eight hundred and thirty seven barrels of oil but the empty tankage was in the wrong place in the bradford field where the daily production had suddenly increased from two thousand barrels in january to eight thousand four hundred and fifty one barrels in december there was only a little over two hundred thousand barrels of tankage in order to take care of the oil the pipelines began to make nearly all their shipments from that field and oil piled up in the lower region to the great dissatisfaction of the producers there as soon as the situation of the bradford field was realized both the united pipes and the producers began a furious campaign of tank building by the beginning of april eighteen seventy eight the tankage there had been increased to one million one hundred and fifty two thousand twenty eight barrels between april one and november one seventy tanks of from ten thousand to twenty five thousand barrels capacity were built in mckean county the greater number of these belonged to the producers according to the united pipeline statement there was under their control in the entire oil regions in october five million two hundred thousand barrels of tankage two-thirds of which belonged to producers but was held by them under a lease but oil poured from the ground faster than tanks could be built in six months that is by july eighteen seventy eight the daily output of bradford had become over eighteen thousand barrels an increase of ten thousand barrels a day over that of the previous december that it was a most difficult situation for everybody is evident there was but one way to prevent loss shut down the wells and stop the drill but this the producers refused to consider of course the price of oil went down rapidly so far did the production exceed consumption but why cried the producer when oil is already so low take advantage of our necessity and force us into competition with each other why enforce this immediate shipment they answered their question themselves and began then to make a charge against the standard which they continue to make today that is that it habitually meets the extraordinary expenses to which it is put by depressing the price of crude oil taking it out of the producer the bradford region demanded great investments therefore immediate shipment the producer pays the writer has no documentary proof that this is mr rockefeller's policy but there is no question that the oil region believes it is and this belief must be taken into account if one attempts to explain the long warfare of the oil country on him and his company it is a common enough thing to-day indeed to hear oil producers in northwestern pennsylvania remark facetiously 
when a new endowment to Chicago University is reported. Yes, I contributed so much on such a day. Don't you remember how the market slumped without a cause? The university needed the money, and so Mr. Rockefeller called on us to stand and deliver. A few months after immediate shipment was begun, a new cause for dissatisfaction arose. More or less private tankage leased to the lines had always been in existence. It enabled the producer to carry his oil without paying storage, and of course it was the business of the company to empty this storage within a reasonable time after the owner demanded it. But in the spring the lines, under the same plea of undercapacity, refused to carry out this duty to the tank owner. That is, they refused to give him his tankage although he had sold his oil. Thus A owns five thousand barrels of tankage. It is full. He sells a proportion of it to Mr. Bostwick and asks the United Pipelines to run the oil accumulated at his wells. But the United Pipelines refuses on the ground that the line is full. The loss to producers incident upon these orders was terrible. All over the Bradford field men saw their oil running on the ground, though they offered to sell it at ruinous prices, and though they might have thousands of barrels of tankage leased to the United Lines. Yet they did not riot, conscious that their own reckless drilling had brought on the trouble, they cursed the standard and put down more wells. But in the spring of 1878, Mr. Rockefeller and his colleagues instituted a series of maneuvers which shattered the last remnant of confidence the oil men had in the sincerity of their claim that they were doing their utmost to relieve the distressed oil regions and that their measures were necessary to hold the producers in check. The pipelines began to refuse to load cars for the shippers who supplied the few independent refiners with oil. The experiences of many of these independent men have been told before the courts. For instance, W. H. Nicholson, the representative of Mr. Olin of New York, a shipper of petroleum, testified that in May 1878 he began to have difficulty in getting cars. At Olean one day Mr. Olin telegraphed to the officials of the Erie Road to know if he could get one hundred cars to run east. The reply came back, yes. About noon, Mr. Nicholson says, he saw Mr. O'Day, the manager of the United Pipelines, in which his oil was stored, and told him that he was waiting to have his cars loaded. Mr. Day at once said he could not load the cars. But I have an order from the Erie officials giving me the cars, Mr. Nicholson objected. That makes no difference, O'Day replied. I cannot load cars except upon an order from Pratt. Nor would he do it. The cars were not loaded for Mr. Nicholson, although at that time he had 10,000 barrels of oil in the United Pipelines and an order for 100 cars from the officials of the Erie Road in his hand. B. B. Campbell, at that time president of the Producers' Union, gave his experience at this time in the suit of the Commonwealth against the Pennsylvania Railroad. I never heard of a scarcity of cars until the early part of June 1878. I came to Parker about five o'clock in the evening and found the citizens in a state of terrible excitement. The pipelines would not run oil unless it was sold. The only shippers we had in Parker of any amount, viz. the agents of the Standard Oil Company, would not buy oil, stating that they could not get cars. Hundreds of wells were stopped to their great injury. Thousands more, whose owners were afraid to stop them for fear of damage by salt water, were pumping the oil on the ground. I used all the influence I had to prevent an outbreak and destruction of railroad and pipelines. I at once went over to the Allegheny Valley Railroad office and telegraphed to John Scott, president of the Allegheny Valley Railroad Company. The refusal of the United to run oil unless sold upon immediate shipment and of the railroad to furnish cars had created such a degree of excitement here that the more conservative part of the citizens will not be able to control the peace and I fear that the scenes of last July will be repeated on an aggravated scale. That message I left in the office about seven o'clock in the evening. I got up the next morning before seven and received an answer. What would you advise should be done? John Scott. I answered, Will you meet tomorrow morning, which would be Saturday? On Saturday morning I came in on an early train and met at the depot Mr. Shin, then, I believe, Vice President of the Allegheny Valley Railroad Company, David A. Stewart, one of the directors of the road, and Thomas M. King, Assistant Superintendent. I spoke very plainly to Mr. Shin, 
telling him that the idea of a scarcity of cars on daily shipments of less than thirty thousand barrels a day was such an absurd barefaced pretense that he could not expect men of ordinary intelligence to accept it, as the preceding fall when business required the railroads could carry day after day from fifty thousand to sixty thousand barrels of oil. Mr. Shin stated clearly that I knew that the Allegheny Valley Railroad Company did not control the oil business over its line, but was governed entirely and exclusively by orders received from the Pennsylvania Railroad Company. I then requested him to be the vehicle of communicating to the Pennsylvania Railroad officials my views on the subject, telling him that I was convinced that unless immediate relief was furnished and cars afforded there would be an outbreak in the oil regions. After further conversation we parted. My interview with them was not as officials of the Allegheny Valley Railroad Company, but as representatives of the oil traffic carried and controlled by the Pennsylvania Road. On the next Monday I returned to Parker. After passing Red Bank, where the low-grade road, the connecting link between the Valley Road and the Philadelphia and Erie Road, meets the Valley Road, between that point and Parker, the express train was delayed for over half an hour in passing through hundreds of empty oil cars. In June another exasperating episode occurred, growing out of the attempts of the oilmen to secure independent routes to the seaboard. As we have seen, two enterprises had been launched late in 1877 under the patronage of the Petroleum Producers' Union. As soon as the Equitable had acquired its right-of-way to Buffalo, Mr. Emery, the head of the company, his papers in hand, sought an interview with representatives of the Buffalo and McKean Road and told them if they did not consent that the Equitable lay a pipeline to their road, and did not contract to carry the oil from that connection to Buffalo, the pipeline to Buffalo would be laid. After considerable negotiation a contract was made with the railroad, and by June the new company was ready with pipeline, cars, and barges to carry oil to New York. But no sooner did they attempt to begin operations than the railroad, under pressure from the Pennsylvania Railroad, it was claimed, refused to carry out its contracts. The cars the Equitable ordered sent to the loading track were refused. A side track it had laid was torn up, the frog torn out. Everything indeed was done to prevent the Equitable doing business, though finally a vigorous appeal to the law brought the road to terms, and in July oil began to flow eastward by this indirect route. No sooner did the Standard find that the Equitable people were really doing business than they appealed to the railroads. A meeting of the representatives of the trunk lines was held in Saratoga in July, and the rates on crude eastward were dropped to eighty cents to meet the new competition. While this fight was going on against the Equitable, all sorts of interference were being put in the way of the seaboard line between Brady's Bend and Baltimore. It was ridiculed as chimerical to attempt to pump oil over the mountains and General Haupt was declared to be a visionary engineer with a record of failures. All the old stories retailed in 1876 were dragged out again. The farmers were told that the leakage from the pipeline would ruin their fields and endanger their buildings, and an active campaign to excite prejudice was carried on again in the farmers' papers. Philadelphia and Pittsburgh both fought the plan, the press and chambers of commerce opposing the free pipe bill at that time before the legislature and the project generally. In Pittsburgh the opposition created almost a riot, for the oil producers of the lower field, who had long bought their supplies there, now threatened to boycott the city if the pipeline was fought. So strong was the opposition that capital took fright, and the company found it most difficult to secure funds. This opposition to the pipeline was, of course, charged against the Standard and the Pennsylvania Railroad. Now, while the railroads were refusing cars to independent shippers, or if they gave an order for them, the United Pipelines were refusing to load them, while the Standard and the railroads were doing their utmost to prevent the Equitable Line doing business, and were discouraging in every way the seaboard pipeline, new routes which would take care of a proportion at least of the oil which they claimed they could not handle, thousands of barrels of oil were running on the ground in Bradford and two of the independent refineries of New York shut down entirely in order that a third of their number might get oil enough to fill an order. This interference with the outside interests 
thus preventing the small degree of relief which they would have afforded and a growing conviction that the standard meant to keep up the immediate shipment order at least until it had built the pipes and tanks needed in the bradford field finally aroused the region to a point where riot was imminent the long line of producers which filed into the united pipelines office day after day to sell their oil at whatever prices they could get for it and who having put in an offer which varied according to their necessities were usually told to come back in ten days and the buyer would see whether he wanted it or not this long line of men began to talk of revolution crowds gathered about the offices of the standard threatening and jeering mysterious things crossbones and death heads were found plentifully sprinkled on the buildings owned by the standard interests more than once the slumber of the oil towns was disturbed by marching bodies of men it was certain that a species of ku klux had hold of the bradford region and that a very little spark was needed to touch off the united pipelines in the meantime things were scarcely less exciting in the lower fields the immediate shipment order was looked upon there as particularly outrageous because there was no lack of lines or tanks in that field and when in the summer of eighteen seventy eight there was added to this cause an unjustifiable scarcity of cars excitement rose to fever heat end of chapter seven part one recording by tom weiss tom's audiobooks dot com chapter seven part two of the history of standard oil volume one by ida tarbell recording by tom weiss the crisis of eighteen seventy eight the only thing which prevented a riot at this time and great destruction of property if not of life was the strong hand the petroleum producers union had on the country fearing that if violence did occur the different movements they had under way would be prejudiced they sent a committee of twenty-five men to harrisburg to see governor hardtramp they laid before him and the attorney general of the state the grievance of the oil producers in an appeal reviewing the history of the industry they demanded that the united pipelines be made to perform its duty as a public carrier and the railroads be made to cease their discrimination against shippers both in the matter of rebates and in furnishing cars they called the governor's attention to the fact that there were already existing laws touching these matters which in their judgment met the case and if the existing laws did not give them relief that it was the plain duty of the executive to call a meeting of the legislature and pass such acts as would do so governor hartramp was much stirred by the story of the producers he went himself to the oil regions to see the situation and in august directed the producers to put their demands into the form of an appeal this was done and it was decided to bring proceedings by writ of quo waranto against the united pipelines and by separate bills in equity against the pennsylvania railroad and the other lines doing business in the state it was september before the state authorities began their investigation of the united pipelines the hearings being held in titusville many witnesses summoned failed to appear but enough testimony was brought out in this investigation to show that the railroads had refused to furnish cars for independence when they had them empty and that the united pipelines had clearly violated its duty as a common carrier in his report on this investigation the secretary of internal affairs william mccandless rendered a verdict that the charges of the oil producers had not been substantiated in any way that demanded action the indignation which followed this report was intense it found a vent in the hanging and effigy of mccandless who was universally known in the state as buck in the oil exchange at parker on the morning of october nineteen the figure of a man was found hanged by the neck to a gallows and the producers left it hanging there all day so that they might jeer and curse it across the forehead of the effigy in large blood-red letters were the words pennsylvania railroad pinned to the gallows there was a card bearing a quotation from secretary mccandless's report the charges of the oil producers have not been substantiated in any way that demands action in bradford a huge effigy hung in the streets all day and in the village of tarport near by another swayed on the gallows 
they pulled down the effigy at Bradford and drew from a pocket what purported to be a check signed by John D. Rockefeller, president of the Standard Oil Company, in favor of Buck McCandless for $20,000 and endorsed by the Pennsylvania Railroad Company. That represented the price, they said, that McCandless got for signing the report. Throughout the oil country there was hardly an oil producer to be found not associated with the Standard Oil Company who did not believe that McCandless had sold himself and his office to the Standard Oil Combination for $20,000 and used the money to help in his congressional canvass. The excitement in the oil regions spread all over the country. Something of the importance the press attached to it may be judged from the way the New York Sun handled the question. For six weeks it kept one of the ablest members of its staff in the oil regions. Six columns of the first page of the issue for November 13 was taken up with the story of the excitement coupled with the full account of the South Improvement Company and the development of the Standard Oil Company out of that concern. On November 23, the first page contained four columns more under blazing headlines. Early in 1879, the hearing of the suits in equity brought by the Commonwealth against the various transportation companies, of which the producers had been complaining, were begun. The witnesses, subpoenaed, failed at first to appear, and when on the stand they frequently refused to reply. But it soon became apparent to them that the state authorities were in earnest and that they must answer or go to Europe. By March 1879 an important array of testimony had been brought out. Among the standard men who had appeared had been John D. Archbold, William Frew, Charles Lockhart, and J. J. Vandergrift. A score or more of producers also appeared. The most important witness from the railroad circles, and indeed the most important witness who appeared, was A. J. Cassett. Mr. Cassett's testimony was startling in its candor and its completeness, and substantiated in every particular what the oil men had been claiming, that the Pennsylvania Railroad had become the creature of the Standard Oil Company, that it was not only giving that company rates much lower than to any other organization, but that it was using its facilities with a direct view of preventing any outside refiner or dealer in oil from carrying on an independent business. The same or similar conditions, not only in oil but in other products which led to these suits, led to investigations in other states. Toward the end of 1878 the Chamber of Commerce of New York City demanded from the legislature of the state an investigation of the New York railroads. This investigation was carried on from the beginning of 1879. The revelations were amazing. Before the Hepburn Commission, as it was called from the name of the chairman, was through with its work, there had appeared before it to give testimony in regard to the conduct of the Standard Oil Company and of the relation of the Erie and the Central Roads to it, H. H. Rogers, J. D. Archbald, Yabez A. Bostwick, and W. T. Scheide. A large number of independent oil men had also appeared. William H. Vanderbilt had been examined and G. H. Blanchard, the freight agent of the Erie Road, had given a full account of the relation of the Erie to the Standard, perhaps the most useful piece of testimony after that of Mr. Cassett belonging to this period of the Standard's history. At the same time that the Pennsylvania suits were going on, and the Hepburn Commission was doing its work, the legislature of Ohio instituted an investigation. It was commonly charged that this investigation was smothered, but it was not smothered until H. M. Flagler had appeared before it and given some most interesting facts concerning rebates. A number of gentlemen who were finding it hard to do oil business also appeared before the Ohio Committee and told their stories. By April 1879 there had been brought out in these various investigations a mass of testimony sufficient in the judgment of certain of the producers to establish the truth of a charge which they had long been making and that was that the Standard was simply a revival of the South Improvement Company. Now the verdict of the Congressional Committee had been that the South Improvement Company was a conspiracy. Therefore, said the producers, the Standard Oil Company is a conspiracy. Their hope had been, from the first, to obtain proof to establish this charge. Having this they believed they could obtain judgment from the courts against the officials of the company, 
and either break it up or put its members in the penitentiary. The more hot-headed of the producers believed they now had this evidence. If one will examine the testimony which had been given thus far in the course of the various examinations, one will see that there was reason for their belief. In the first place, it had been established that all the stockholders of the South Improvement Company, excepting four, were now members of the Standard Oil Combination. Indeed, the only persons holding high positions in the new combination at this date who were not South Improvement Company men were Charles Pratt, J. J. Vandergrift, H. H. Rogers, and John D. Archibald. The South Improvement Company had been a secret organization. So was the new Standard Alliance. That is, the most strenuous efforts had been made to keep it secret. For instance, the sale of the works of Lockhart, Warden, and Pratt to the Standard was kept from the public. Indeed, it was a year after these sales before even the Erie Railroad knew that Mr. Rockefeller had any affiliations besides those with Pratt and Company, and it made its contracts with him on this assumption. When purchases of refineries were made, it was the custom to continue the business under the name of the original concern. Thus, when Mrs. B. of Cleveland sold in 1878, as recounted in the last chapter, the persons selling were obliged to keep the sale secret even from the employees of the concern. The understanding was with regard to the sale of the property to the Standard Oil Company, said the shipping clerk in his affidavit, that it should not be known outside of their own parties that it was to be kept a profound secret, and that the business was to be carried on as if the B Oil Company was still a competitor. The secret rights with which the contract was made in 1876 between Mr. Rockefeller and Schofield, Shermer, and Teagle have already been described. To keep the relations of the various standard concerns secret, Mr. Rockefeller went so far in 1880 as to make an affidavit like the following. It is not true, as stated by Mr. Teagle in his affidavit, that the Standard Oil Company, directly or indirectly through its officers or agents, owns or controls the works of Warden, Prue and Company, Lockhart, Prue and Company, J. A. Bostwick and Company, C. Pratt and Company, Acme Refining Company, Imperial Refining Company, Camden Consolidated Company, and the DeVoe Manufacturing Company. Nor is it true that the Standard Oil Company, directly or indirectly through its officers or agents, owns or controls the refinery at Hunters Point, New York. It is not true that the Standard Oil Company, directly or indirectly through its officers or agents, purchased or acquired the Empire Transportation Company, or furnished the money therefor. Nor is it true that the Standard Oil Company inaugurated or began or induced any other person or corporation to inaugurate or begin a war upon the Pennsylvania Railroad Company or the Empire Transportation Company, as stated in the affidavit of Mr. Teagle. There may be a technical explanation of this affidavit, although the writer knows of none. There is certainly abundant testimony in existence that the works of Messrs. Pratt, Lockhart, and Warden, at least, had been bought long before this affidavit was made and paid for in Standard Oil Company stock, and that they were working in alliance with that company. It was shown in the last chapter that on October 17, 1877, the Standard Oil paid $2,500,000 in certified checks on the purchasing price of the plant of the Empire Transportation Company. While none of the other members of the Standard Oil Company examined in 1879, was quite so sweeping in his denials, all of them evaded direct answers. The reason they gave for this evasion was that the investigations were an interference with their rights as private citizens, and that the government had no business to inquire into their methods. Consequently, when asked questions, they refused to answer by advice of counsel. Ultimately, the gentlemen did answer a great many questions. But taking the testimony all in all, through these years, it certainly is a mild characterization to say that it totally lacks in frankness. The testimony of the Standard officials before the Hepburn Commission was so evasive that the committee, in making its report, spoke bitterly of the company as a mysterious organization whose business and transactions are of such a character that its members decline giving a history or description of it, lest this testimony be used to convict them of a crime. The producers certainly were right in claiming that secrecy was a characteristic of the Standard, as it had been of the South Improvement Company. 
the new standard combination like the south improvement company aimed at controlling the entire refining interest the coal oil business belongs to us mr rockefeller once told a recalcitrant refiner his associates were saying the same on all sides the object of the standard oil company is to secure the entire refining business of the world a member of the concern told b f nye an ohio producer the method the standard depended upon to secure this control was the same as the method of the south improvement company special privileges in transportation we have seen how intelligently and persistently mr rockefeller worked to secure these special privileges until in eighteen seventy seven he had made with all the trunk lines contracts which in every particular paralleled the contracts which in january eighteen seventy two messrs scott gold vanderbilt and mcclellan made with the south improvement company he now had a rebate on every barrel of oil he shipped and this was given with the understanding that the railroad should allow no rebate to any other shipper unless that shipper could guarantee and furnish a quantity of oil for shipment which would after deduction of his commission realized to the road the same amount of profit realized from the standard trade he also had a drawback on every barrel his rival shipped no clause in the south improvement company's contract with railroads had given more offence to the oil world than that which called for a drawback to the company on the oil shipped by outsiders it will be remembered that the beneficiaries of this contract were to receive drawbacks of a dollar six cents a barrel on all crude oil that outside parties shipped from the oil regions to new york and a proportionate drawback on that shipped from other points the rebate system was considered illegal and unjust but men were more or less accustomed to it the drawback on other people's shipment was a new device and it threw the oil region into a frenzy of rage it did not seem possible that the standard would attempt to revive this practice again and yet when it had got its hands strongly on the four trunk lines it made a demand for the drawback it has already been recounted how on february five eighteen seventy eight four months after the pennsylvania succumbed to the standard's demand mr o'day wrote to mr cassett i here repeat what i once stated to you and which i wish you to receive and treat as strictly confidential that we have been for many months receiving from the new york central and erie railroads certain sums of money in no instance less than twenty cents per barrel on every barrel of crude oil carried by each of these roads cooperating as we are doing with the standard oil company and the trunk lines in every effort to secure for the railroads paying rates of freight on the oil they carry i am constrained to say to you that in justice to the interests i represent we should receive from your company at least twenty cents on each barrel of crude oil you transport and mr cassett after seeing the freight bills showing that both the central and erie allowed a drawback gave orders that the pennsylvania pay one of twenty-two and a half cents when mr cassett was under examination in eighteen seventy four the examiner remarked i understand mr cassett that this twenty-two and a half cents paid to the american transfer company is not restricted to all oil that passed through their lines no sir it is paid on all oil received and transferred by us among the interesting documents presented at this inquiry was a statement of the crude oil shipments over the pennsylvania road for february and march eighteen seventy eight they footed up to a total of three hundred and forty three thousand seven hundred and sixty seven and a half barrels on this amount a discount of twenty cents a barrel was allowed to the standard oil company through its agent the american transfer company among other agents who shipped this oil was h c olin in all mr olin shipped twenty nine thousand eight hundred and seventy six barrels and on this the standard oil company received twenty cents a barrel that is after mr olin had paid for his oil paid for having it carried by the pipeline to the railroad and paid the railroad the full rate of freight without the commission the standard received the pennsylvania was obliged to turn over to the standard oil company twenty cents of the amount he had paid on each barrel the examiner tried very hard to find out if there was a legitimate question why such an allowance should have been made to the american transfer company on oil it did not handle we pay that mr cassett said as a commission to them to aid in securing us our share of the trade we pay it said the comptroller 
for procuring oil to go over the lines in which the Pennsylvania Railroad is interested as against the New York lines and the New York Central. Do you understand, the examiner questioned of one of the auditors, that the American Transfer Company secured to the Pennsylvania Road the traffic of the outside refiners of New York, mentioned in the statement quoted above? I never raised a question of that kind in my mind, answered the adroit auditor. But the answer was evident. The American Transfer Company had nothing whatever to do with the oil shipped by Mr. Olin or Ayers Lombard and Company or J. Rousseau or any one of the other independents mentioned in the statement, unless perchance that oil had come originally from the lines of the American Transfer Company. In that case, the shipper had paid the line for the service rendered at the time he bought the oil, the custom then and now. The tax was paid by the Pennsylvania solely because the Standard Oil Company had the power to demand it. The demand was made in the name of the American Transfer Company as a blind. Naturally, the proof that the Standard had revived the most obnoxious feature of the South Improvement Company aroused intense bitterness and disgust among the oil men. Another offensive clause of the 1872 contracts was that pledging the railroads to lower or raise the gross rates of transportation for such times and to such extent as might be necessary to overcome competition. Now, the new contracts of the Standard provided the same arrangement. That is, they stipulated that the rates were to be lowered if necessary, so as to place the Standard on a parity with shippers by competing lines. The workings of the clause were illustrated when the producers got the equitable line through in 1878, the railroads dropping their charge to 80 cents a barrel, and in some cases even less. The producers certainly had evidence enough for their claim that the contracts of the South Improvement Company and the Standard Oil Company with the railroads were similar in every particular as far as principles were concerned, that they differed alone in the amounts of the rebates and drawbacks. There was plenty of evidence brought out also to show that the object of the Standard operations was like that of the South Improvement Company, keeping up the price of refined oil. Both combinations were formed to keep the refined article scarce on the market by controlling all the refineries and by refusing to sell under competition. The officials of the South Improvement Company stated under oath that they had hoped to raise the price 50 percent. The central organization hoped to put up the price of refined from 15 to 25 cents. As a matter of fact, that organization, when it finally got control of the market, put up the price considerably more. The spectacular demonstration in the winter of 1876 and 1877 of what could be done in keeping up the price of refined was still rankling in the minds of the oil men. They saw that it was by that coup that the Standard had gotten the ready money to pay for the plant of the Empire Transportation Company, the money to buy in whatever it wanted, the money to pay the 50 percent dividend to which one of its members testified in the Ohio investigation. They remembered that while the refiners had been selling refined around 30 cents a gallon, they had sold crude at less than four dollars a barrel. Little wonder then that they felt they had evidence that the Standard had actually done what they had always claimed it would do if it got hold of the refining interest as it planned. Even in the case where certain large producers had entered into a partnership with the Standard on condition that they pay them prices for crude commensurate with the price of refined, these producers claimed the agreement had not been kept. One of these cases came to light in a suit instituted in 1878. It seems that sometime in December 1874, the large oil company of H. L. Taylor & Company sold one-half interest in its property to the Standard Oil Company. The reason for the sale the plaintiffs stated in their complaint to be as follows. The extent of their, the Standard's business and control over pipelines and refineries, had enabled them to procure, and they had procured from the railways, more favorable terms for transportation than others could obtain. These advantages and facilities placed it within their power to obtain, and they did obtain, far better and more uniform prices for petroleum than could be obtained by the plaintiffs. The said organization and firms, by virtue of their monopoly of the business of refining and transportation of oil, had been at times almost the only buyers in the market and at such times had been enabled to dictate and establish a price for crude oil 
far below its actual value, as determined by prices of refined oil at same dates, and they thus obtained a large share of the profits which should have fallen to the plaintiff and other purchasers. The sale was made, and in consideration of the foregoing premises, and upon the promise and agreement on the part of the defendants that the partnership thus formed should have the benefit of the advantage and facilities of the said defendants, and the organizations and firms managed and controlled by defendants in marketing its oil. That the firm should have, to the extent of its production, the advantage of the sales of refined by the defendants or said Standard Oil Company, either for present or future delivery, so that there should be at no time any margin or difference between the ruling price of refined oil and the price which defendants would pay the partnership for crude by it produced, beyond the necessary cost of refining. This thing formed the inducement and the larger part of the consideration for the sale of said property to the defendants. The amount actually received for said interest was far beneath its actual value, and without the agreement on the part of the defendants to pay to the partnership for its product prices at all times commensurate with the prices of refined oil, they would not have sold the said interest nor entered into said partnership. The defendants also requested to do so have not only failed, neglected, and refused to comply with this agreement, but have, by false and erroneous statements, misled the plaintiffs and induced them to consent to the sale to them and to the Standard Oil Company of large quantities of crude petroleum produced by the partnership at prices far below its actual value, to the great loss and damage of the orators. That on or about December 6, 1876, Refined was selling at a price equivalent to $7 for crude oil, at which time plaintiffs called upon defendants for a compliance with their agreement and asked that they take or purchase 210,000 barrels of the production of the partnership at a price commensurate with the price of refined at that time. This defendants neglected and refused to do, and the partnership was forced to sell the same at prices varying from 3 to $4, making a loss to the partnership upon this one transaction of from 600000 to $1 million, for which said defendants neglect and refuse to account, that the said defendants for themselves and for the said Standard Oil Company and other organizations and firms aforesaid have since the formation of the partnership received from the railways a rebate or drawback in the shape of wheelage or otherwise at times as high as $1 per barrel upon all oil shipped by them to the seaboard that instead of using these advantages which they possess for the benefit and profit of the partnership, as they covenanted to do, they have used them against its interest by restraining trade, preventing competition, and forcing plaintiffs to accept any price which defendants, the said Standard Oil Company, or the other organizations aforesaid might offer for their production. That the amount of oil produced and sold by the partnership for the three years beginning with the date of its formation, and ending December 1, 1877 was 2,657,830 barrels of oil. That the profits of defendants upon oil refined by them during said period, taking into consideration the rebates and drawbacks received from the railways, have averaged at least one dollar per barrel over and above the cost of refining, and at times as high as four and five dollars that these profits under the partnership agreement that no margin should exist between crude and refined prices should to the extent of the production of the partnership have been paid by defendants to the partnership, that the amount lost by the partnership and realized by the defendants by reason of the failure and refusal of said defendants to comply with their agreement is not less than $2,500,000 for one half of which defendants should account to your orders but which they neglect and refuse to do so. Naturally enough, the producers now pointed out that the case of the H. L. Taylor Company was a demonstration of what they had claimed in 1872, when the South Improvement Company, alarmed at the uprising, offered them a contract, and what they had always claimed since when the Standard Oil offered contracts for oil on a sliding scale, viz. that such contracts were never meant to be kept that they were obliged to enable the Standard to make scoops such as they had made in the winter of 1876 and 1877. Taking all these points into consideration, first, that the Standard Oil Company, like the South Improvement Company, was a secret organization. Second, that both companies were composed in the main of the same parties. 
third that it aimed like its predecessors at getting entire control of the refining interests fourth that it used the power the combination gave it to get rebates on its own oil shipments and drawbacks on the shipments of other people fifth that it had arranged contracts which compelled the railroads to run out all competition by lowering their rates sixth that it aimed to put up the price of refined without allowing the producer a share of the profits taking all these points into consideration many of the producers including the president of the petroleum producers union b b campbell and certain members of his council came to the conclusion that as they had sufficient evidence against the members of the standard combination to ensure conviction for criminal conspiracy they should proceed against them strenuous opposition to the proceedings as hastily and ill-advised developed in the council and the legal committee but the majority decided that the prosecution should be instituted mr scott and mr cassett were omitted from the proposed indictment on the ground that they were already weary of the standard and would cease their illegal practices gladly if they could on the twenty ninth day of april eighteen seventy nine the grand jury of the county of clarion found an indictment against john d rockefeller william rockefeller jabez a bostwick daniel o'day william g warden charles lockhart henry m flagler jacob j vandergrift and george w gertie gertie was the cashier of the standard oil company there were eight counts in the indictment and charged in brief a conspiracy for the purpose of securing a monopoly of the business of buying and selling crude petroleum and to prevent others than themselves from buying and selling and making a legitimate profit thereby a combination to oppress and injure those engaged in producing petroleum a conspiracy to prevent others than themselves from engaging in the business of refining petroleum and to secure a monopoly of that business for themselves a combination to injure the carrying trade of the allegheny valley and pennsylvania railroad companies by preventing them from receiving the natural petroleum traffic to divert the traffic naturally belonging to the pennsylvania carriers to those of other states by unlawful means and to extort from railroad companies unreasonable rebates and commissions and by fraudulent means and devices to control the market prices of crude and refined petroleum and acquire unlawful gains thereby four of the persons mentioned in the indictment messrs o'day warden lockhart and vandergrift all citizens of pennsylvania gave bail and early in june application was made to governor hoyt of pennsylvania to issue a requisition before the governor of new york for the extradition of the other five gentlemen with damaging testimony piling up day by day in three states and with an indictment for conspiracy hanging over the heads of himself and eight of his associates matters looked gloomy for john d rockefeller in the spring of eighteen seventy nine the good of the oil business certainly seemed to be in danger End of chapter seven recording by tom weiss tom's audiobooks dot com